The world feels quite strange right now, unsettled yet promising. One thing is clear, we're not going back to a pre-COVID normal. COVID gave us refreshed hope on the capacity we have to accelerate change and in so doing opened a new world of possibilities. Our response demonstrated that fundamental change on a global scale is not only possible, it can be achieved faster than anyone could have previously imagined. How quickly did we unlearn deeply entrenched habits in every corner of our societies and find new ways to live and work? We reimagined, restructured, innovated, adapted, repurposed systems we'd built to become systems we need. Through this time, leaders emerged all around us. We trusted them to guide us through the crisis. We hung on their every word and action to inform us what to do next. Two years of uncertainty has given rise to pandemic epiphanies about the meaning and purpose of work. And importantly, it catalyzed a fundamental rethink of leadership. To talk about the modern art of leadership, we're excited to talk to Dr. Kirsten Ferguson. By way of quick introduction, Kirsten has a PhD in leadership and culture and was the only Australian to be named as one of the top 30 international leadership thinkers to watch in 2021 by Thinkers 50. She's a company director, former deputy chair of the ABC and co-author of Womankind. Welcome, Kirsten. Am I exaggerating the pandemic epiphanies? A recent Microsoft Work study showed 41% of employees are considering leaving their current employer. That's huge. Is that a nod to a really shifting mindset? What's driving that? Absolutely. You are not exaggerating pandemic epiphanies. And yes, there is a really shifting mindset. In the US at the moment, we're seeing the data already where there are record what they call quit rates of people leaving their jobs. And there's a few reasons driving that. Pandemic epiphanies is one, and I'll come to that in a moment. But there's also, you know, the backlog of people who might have left their jobs in 2020, but held on to them because they weren't certain about where the pandemic was going. There's burnout. So those frontline workers like hospitality and retail or teachers or healthcare workers who are finally, you know, they're exhausted. They've had this incredible two years. And then the third reason is around remote work and those who have loved working from home and don't really want to go back to the old way of doing things. But the pandemic epiphany that you mentioned is what's really interesting. And that's where people are questioning what am I doing? Like, what is the purpose of this organisation that I've been coming along to for years on end? You know, why am I doing it? Why am I having to fit work into my life rather than the other way around? And people are really finding different paths and deciding that perhaps now is the time to start a new business or a new turn a side hustle into a main hustle or to go and find an employer that actually understands where they're coming from. So Kirsten, I know everyone around the world is talking and very focused on the great resignation, but you've coined a new phrase, which is the great realignment. How did you get to that? Well, I was researching the great resignation for a piece that I wrote and, you know, I just couldn't help but thinking focusing on resignation rates is frankly all too late. You know, if you've already got people walking out the door, you've already got a major problem. So what is it that we can do as leaders? And I'm always thinking about the opportunity for leaders to try and stop people leaving in the first place. And that's where this idea of, you know, realigning purpose, realigning why we work, and even as individuals, realigning what it is we want to do. It's finding all of those and bringing those together, which I think are the factors that lead to this great realignment, which truly is an opportunity rather than being an outcome like the great resignation is. So, Kirsten, I'm going to read this because I saw this on the way here. I saw a great tweet from someone that said, I want to be endlessly curious. I want to be excited every day about my work. I want to do it on my terms to choose when, how and with whom. Has the power dynamic now shifted to the employees? Yeah, pretty much. So in Australia, we're not yet seeing the resignation rates that the US is seeing, and that's for a whole range of reasons. Hopefully, we won't see it if we have leaders who really adapt and realign as we need to. But exactly like you've just quoted, it requires a real modern leader to listen to what their employees are saying and really listen. I don't mean just put out a survey, but go and find out what's driving that. 
and find out what they mean about wanting to make different choices or, or find a way to live their life and integrate their work. And I think this is really a significant shift from how that employer-employee dynamic has always operated. And as we have a skill shortage in Australia, employees are sort of voting with their feet and they're either going to find employers that can meet those needs or they're doing something for themselves. So, Kirsten, do you think it's time up for traditional leaders? Are they a pre-pandemic relic? I think the traditional leader is certainly going to find themselves either with a whole range of other traditional leaders where that's what works for them or they're going to be finding themselves moving out of organisations that are really trying to put employees and and the human factor right at the centre. I think we all know those people who, you know, want to go back to work now as we're all returning to the office and just pretend it's February 2020 as though the last two years haven't happened. We're just going to go back to how it was always done, the commute, the meeting in person when you could easily do it on Zoom, um, thinking that just having a policy around flexibility is enough. And what we're learning through the great resignation in the US and what I think we can address it through the great realignment here is having modern leaders who are really thinking with their heads and their hearts about how to address this problem. And that takes leaders who can lead with insight into the impact they're having on others. It's leading with empathy about what's really going on for your team members. It's having the courage to actually actually, you know, speak up and say, hey, I think we can be doing things differently. And I think all of this requires leaders who are also humble, humble that we don't know all the answers, but that we're there listening and really trying to make sure that the future of our organisations matches this changing dynamic that we're experiencing. So do you think there's a framework? Can you guide us? Is there a framework to what a modern leader should look like? Are there new traits? Well, I think that some of the research I'm doing at the moment, I like to think of um, this idea of the art of modern leadership. And to me, you know, it's leading with the head of the heart. But I want to explain what I mean about that yeah. because I guess I think of leadership a bit like following a recipe. Okay. So in some situations to get the best possible outcome, whether it's a decision or a conversation or a crisis, you know, you might need a kilogram of curiosity, a cup of wisdom and say a teaspoon of courage to get the best decision or the best outcome it can. But there's going to be other circumstances where you need three cups of humility, a teaspoon of empathy and maybe just a dash of perspective. Knowing what ingredient is needed when is the art of being a modern leader. And for all of the leadership experiences we might have and the different teams we lead and the different ways we seek to lead in formal or informal ways, all of it comes down to knowing how best to lead with our head and our heart. And when I think about leading with our head, it's sort of made up of four main attributes. And if you think about these, we have them generally in abundance. It's what we're taught at school. It's what we're rewarded for at work. The first being curiosity. The second is wisdom, third perspective or strategy, and then the fourth is capability and being, you know, technically able to do whatever we do. But in addition to that, we absolutely need to have the skills, and every modern leader does, of being able to lead with humility and Mm -hmm. with insight and, as I said earlier, courage and empathy. So just on that, though, Kirsten, resilience and empathy and the ability to communicate are clearly now more important since the crisis, but haven't they always been important? Yes, (laughs) Yes, <laughs> absolutely. But have we always been great at rewarding leaders for that? No. no. And I think that's one of the areas that organisations will change. And it's recognising that it's the modern leaders we need. And actually, as a, an organisation, thinking to yourself, who are the leaders that we have leading our business? And I do believe that everyone is a leader. So it doesn't matter what your formal title is. Um, We all influence those around us through the way we ask for things to be done or the way we take feedback. Yeah, I think there's some really interesting research around now. So Edelman came out with some research that said 92% of employees were looking to their leaders to speak out on issues like reskilling, the ethical use of technology, income inequalities, diversity, climate change. How do we embrace the shifting mindset that that statistic of 92% really signifies. And do you think that's going to be lasting, that need? 
Absolutely. And, you know, I think it's exciting. It's exciting that we're recognising this opportunity to really embrace new ways of thinking and new ways of leading. Because if we think back to leadership models, they came about the 18th century with this great man theory, you know, where only the privileged white men were entitled to lead. Your leaders were born, not made. And we have clearly shown over the last few centuries that, A, that's just totally archaic and has been debunked and we want to hear from all leaders, diverse leaders, women, those uh, informal leaders. And if we look at movements, whether it's Time's Up or Black Lives Matter, there's leaders coming from every part of society and we need to embrace those. Going with that, though, is also an expectation that the areas we emphasise leaders to educate themselves around must adapt and must change and must expand. And I think being a modern leader um, is a curious leader and it means asking those questions we just don't know the answers to and being humble enough to go and understand I need to read and learn and speak with others and find thought leaders to learn from. That is all part of that continuous and never-ending improvement as a leader. So it seems a really popular thread that everyone is a leader. My question to you, though, is, is the concept of who we see as a leader changing because of the pandemic or is this something that was already evolving? That's a really good question, Sunita. And I think it's always been there. It's that we haven't recognised or acknowledged or celebrated leaders who are around us every day. I mean, if we think about our formative years at school, we always had those teachers who were inspirational and set us on different paths. They are leaders, but yet it hasn't always been those kinds of leaders we've read about in the history books or have seen getting knighthoods or awards or whatever it might be. So I do think the leaders have always been amongst us. But what is different now is that recognition that we can and should learn from all leaders. I mean, we've got a, I'm not sure how old she is now, but I'm sure she's less than 20, Greta Thunberg, leading a climate change conversation. I mean, who would have ever thought that we would have teenagers in the past that would have been given a platform and that would have been respected and heard? And it's so important that we as uh other formal leaders or whatever our roles might be, pay respect to the fact that we have leaders around us who might not come from a traditional background but that are valuable and should be respected and heard. Kirsten, can these skills of modern leadership be taught? You know, you mentioned a few moments ago that, you know, leaders, that the notion of leaders born, not made. Can we teach these modern skills? Absolutely. So I think the idea that uh, leaders are born, not made, came from a very privileged group of Mm -hmm. white men in the 18th century for whom it was very convenient that that view was given, that leaders could only be born. Uh, We have debunked that over the centuries. And I think some people are more inclined to be um, a leader who leads with empathy or who's a technically brilliant leader, just like you have some people who are more inclined to go and win an Olympic gold medal, you know, at the 100 metres. I don't think it would matter how much I trained to run the 100 metres, even from the age of five, I was never going to win a gold medal. But all of us can improve those skills and that doesn't change. So even if, you know, you're a pretty good leader now, you've still got a lifetime of learning to do. So it's never that we are a finished leader. We're always a work in progress. So let's linger on the work in progress because you coach, you speak, you write, and you champion this art of modern leadership. What are some of the pushbacks or the challenges that you might hear um, with people that are trying to embrace this new kind of leadership? I think it's uncomfortable for some leaders who have really achieved all they've achieved by leading in a certain way. And that's okay if it's working for you and your organisation. And there will be some organisations where a very traditional style of leadership is valued and rewarded and uh, that is culture. It's that I'm not sure that you'll attract 
new younger types of workers into those environments if that is the only culture that's being perpetuated in, a, in any particular business. I think we need diverse types of leaders, so I'm certainly not suggesting that everyone should be the same, but I think within the scope of being a modern leader and those attributes I spoke of of leading with the head and the heart, mm-hmm. as long as you've got some level of balance across those eight attributes, you're heading in the right direction because even leaders who have been very traditional and have always felt, for example, that they need to know the answer. And we all know leaders like that. And it's an example of pushback. You know, I can't possibly be vulnerable and and admit to my team, I don't know what to do. Well, in fact, a modern leader can and does and uses that as an opportunity to say, I don't have the answer to this particular problem, but I know you all do. And I know that together as a team, we're going to be able to solve this far better than if I try and solve it on my own. You have that opportunity then to bring everyone along with you and it's leading. So I think there's a whole range of ways we need to rethink for traditional leaders what it means to lead and what the people you are leading truly want to see. Authenticity is just so important. Vulnerability, humility, all of those attributes I was speaking about, they are what will really energise and motivate your team to follow the vision or the purpose of the organisation that you're leading in. So let's keep that notion of authenticity when I ask you this question, because TEDx is a platform to nurture powerful ideas. And we often use the term thought leadership. It breeds horror in so many people. You and I, I, I'm sure, are both of those too. But Edelman and LinkedIn found that 82% of people believe that thought leadership shared by someone they know and respect is a critical factor in getting them to engage with the content. Yet, with everyone living in what has been almost an entirely digital experience for the last two years, we've seen probably a glut of low quality thought leadership come out into the market, probably diluting its perceived value. You must have seen it too. What's some of your guidance here for people that are embracing wanting to engage with their employees, their customers, their stakeholders through thought leadership? That is such a great question. And the reason I love it is because it brings to the fore the power of social media. And I love social media, so I use all the platforms, but you see the best and worst of humanity (laughs) on social media. Some of the best uh, relationships I've formed as and business opportunities and legitimate, you know, conversations about where the world can go and, and thought leadership conversations happen on social media. Yet, we know that also on social media there is a lot of misinformation and there are groups putting out research that's not really research and there's no critical thinking about what people are seeing. So I think there's this real dichotomy between how it can be used for good and how it can potentially be used in a way that's unhelpful is probably the kindest way to put it. And I've got to tell you, the term thought leader is cringeworthy, as you said. So can I just pull two themes from what you've been saying, one of which is um, around thought leadership, one of which is that every word and action now matters when we look at our leaders, and the other being the framework which you discussed around the heart and the mind, the head and the heart. How would you apply those two then to guiding someone to what they should be delivering as thought leadership? Do those two things matter? Yeah, well, I think you're leading always, whether you're leading on social media or in a post that you're doing or whether you're leading in front of a group of a 1,000 people that you actually employ or whether you're leading in your family or in your community. Every time you say something, you're being judged not only for the leader you are but the leader you could potentially be. Kirsten, that was a great chat. It's always terrific talking to you. Thank you for joining us. Thank you so much. I think this is a fantastic conversation to be having on the eve of 2022 and will probably carry right through the next year. But on that note, let me wrap by saying, whilst COVID has certainly shaken the set piece of our normality, the cracks have given way to glimmers of new exciting possibilities for the year ahead. There is change happening and that didn't seem possible before. The unusual levels of global and community collaboration, in fact, The way we now see the world, the voices that can now be heard, give us all a responsibility to be aware of the words we use, the choices we make, and the actions we take. 
Thank you, Kirsten, for inspiring us to remember that we can all practice the art of modern leadership and ensure the impact we're having and the legacy we leave is a positive one. <laughs>